So welcome everyone to this Belfast Summer School Lecture. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker today, Professor Roy Gibson, and he is a native of Belfast. We've just been discussing, we're both from Dundonald in East Belfast, and we've been discussing the areas that we know. Um, so he's from not far from where I am right now, and uh, Professor Gibson works in the Department of Classics at Durham University. Previously, he worked at the University of Manchester and Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. Uh, Roy was chair of the Classical Association in the UK from 2013 to 2020, and he's currently involved in an AHRC project on ancient letters. But for us today, he's going to talk about how much Latin is there. So over to you, Roy. Um, thank you so much, Helen. I hope everyone can hear me and put it in the chat if my signal uh, goes down. I want to thank Helen very much for this um, invitation. And she's, I'm from Belfast and it's a great honour to be invited to address you. And, um, and uh, aside from my parents in the audience, I can see Joanne Brown, who we did our PhD together at Cambridge a, a thousand years ago. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very good to see you, Joanne. So I'm just going to try to share my screen here and hope that it works. So um, how much Latin is there? Now you can, uh, shouldn't interfere too much, I hope. Okay, um, I'm teaching my own, uh, my elder son, David Latin at the minute, just at home. Um, and um, I'm just at the very beginning of the stages, you know, nominative case, accusative case. And, I know, I know many of you are at that stage, though some of you are much more advanced, then it seemed, must seem a bit of a, an odd question to be asking how much Latin is there when you're looking at the nuts and bolts of the language and you know, where's the verb gone and why is it in this order? So, um, but I think when you're looking at the very smallest details, it's sometimes helpful to look, step back and look at the very biggest details. And I hope that you'll, 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 you'll enjoy this. And, the question, how much Latin is there? I became interested in it because it's a question you should be able to find out the answer to easily, but you can't. So no one seems interested in, as, in answering it, at least uh, in any detail. So I had to go and find out the answer to, to, to the question um, myself. Now, there's, there's, there's a lot of statistics and numbers in this, okay? Look, but but if, you, if, you, if there are no interest, you don't worry about that. There's a bigger picture, which I'm going to try and emphasize. So, um, how much Latin is there? Well, depends what you mean by Latin, and uh, that's the short answer. And the, the lo longer answer is, well, depending on how you define Latin, there's either a lot less than you think, and there's also more than you can possibly imagine. And we'll see how both of those are true in a few moments. So, what do I mean by that? There's less and there's more. Well, there's roughly four ages of Latin. Um, classical Latin, uh, which is roughly the second century BC to the second or third century AD. And that includes all the well-known characters from Terence, again, who's quite early, uh, Cicero, Virgil, Ovid, and so on. Then roughly late antiquity, well, it depends where you want to start. There's some people start in the third century, but roughly it's from when Constantine's Edict of Toleration for Christianity um, is in the early um, early fourth century, and that's roughly when the antiquity is said to begin. Is when Rome begins to transition into a Christian society, and it goes on roughly the sixth century or so, and includes all the giants of the early church of Ambrose, Augustine, and Jerome. Then medieval Latin um, should we say that late antiquity is a, a fairly recent invention? It's taken place in 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 our in our lifetimes. Used to be thought that the, you know, the medieval period began immediately, you know, about two about two fifty AD. But um, people want to divide up um, a bit more neat, um, make better divisions. Now, anyway, medieval Latin was roughly the seventh century AD till um, the the age of Petrarch, perhaps thirteen fifties to thirteen seventies, or the invention of print, which is in the fourteen fifties. Now, this is when Latin is quite different from. Um, classical and late antique Latin. Classical and late antique Latin are the same language. 
Okay, there, and we'll come, come back to that issue later. If you can read classical Latin, you can read late antique Latin. Medieval Latin is much more of a challenge because the, the syntax and the vocabulary does change a bit. But then we get Neo Latin, anything written from Petrarch onwards, and um, then that's modeled on classical Latin for the most part. Um, and if you read, can read classical Latin, then you can read Neo Latin. And this is a huge body of material. People like Poliziano, Politian, also in. Uh, People we know right in the English language tradition, John Donne, John Milton, they write Latin poems and right up to their Twitter account of Papa F. F. Franciscus, so which is uh, worth a read. So, um, right, classical Latin. Now, here is the industry standard, the Oxford Latin Dictionary. And if you want to look at how it defines classical Latin, it's quite interesting. It covers text up to around about the year 200 AD. It doesn't go beyond that. Add some, some later texts, but it excludes all Christian writings of any kind. So you get these oddities like Alpian, who's one of the most important legal writers in Rome, born in 170 AD. He's in, but the Christian Tertullian, who lived his life mostly in the second century, born in 155. He's out, as it were. So there's this kind of um, exclusion of, of, of Christian writers. Now, there was a practical reason for that decision, at least at least on the face of it. Um, Augustine, uh, we have over 5 million words from the pen of Augustine. That's a lot. And that is bigger than the entire corpus of Latin that survives before the age of Augustine. Augustine is basically um, late fourth century, early fifth century, and his corpus is bigger than everything that survives from before him. So he said, do you know what? We don't want to take Augustine on. We'll just throw all Christians out. And uh, that's why, this is, well, the Oxford Latin Dictionary has an incomplete picture of Latin, but that's one way that, that classical Latin is often defined. And um, I'm gonna look at um, uh, some of the consequences of that decision later. Okay, so, so I wanna know how big this corpus is. Um, and again, no one seems to, uh, to um, be interested in answering this question, but someone has done it for Greek recently. Uh, and a very long and absolutely brilliant book. I guess the most important book published in classical literature in the last decade. It's Revial Nets, Scale, Space and Canon in Ancient Literary Culture. And he's part of this Stanford quantitative school that, that likes producing big, big statistics. Uh, and then me, me, uh, Walter Scheidel's in it as well, uh, on Ancient Roman story. Anyway, so he tries to do it for Greek. And he comes up with some very, very interesting answers. Okay, so, and I'm going to use this as a model for, for trying to do it for Latin. Okay, so he reckons that what he does, he's, he's spent years doing this. He spent five or six years doing it. He's looked at attestations in ancient works and trying to work out on the basis of probability how many more authors there were beyond those are, are simply name, names to us. And based on these, uh, on partly on probability theory, he reckons that by the end of the second century AD, 30,000 people had written literature in Greek. Well, this includes everything. It includes medicine, it includes law, uh, it includes philosophy, it includes local history of which there was absolute shed loads in antiquity. But already in antiquity, most of it was lost. 10,000 still had works circulating by the end of the second century AD. So by the end of the second century AD, two thirds of it was already gone. And he says, and he, he shows that the number had perhaps fallen to somewhere, there's no more than a thousand by the ninth century AD in Byzantium. So, and today there's only around 200 classical Greek authors are transmitted either in whole works or in whole parts of works. Mm -hmm. So if you have a single book surviving that, that you wrote in your lifetime that we still have, then you're included in this figure. So only 200 uh, survive today. 
That's what he reckons. So that means that the surviving Greek authors, those who either have a whole work surviving, lots of work surviving, or just one book of a work, they represent perhaps 2% of the total circulating in 200 AD and well below the 1% of the authors active to that date. Now, we can add to that total. We have a huge number of surviving fragmentary Greek authors, because as you know, um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, many sensational discoveries were made in Egypt. So um, in Oxyrhynchus, for example, um, this is um, a, a city in Egypt near an oasis in, in the desert. They found the town's rubbish dump and when they dug down into it, of course, there's very little rain in Egypt. All these papyri that people had thrown away for hundreds of years in Oxyrhynchus had lots and lots of um, bits and pieces of text in them. So we have many, many fragmentary authors that have been dug up in the 20th century. So, uh, and the 19th century, even so, when we add them to our total, we've got no more than 5% of pre-200 AD authors have survived in any form, okay? And as for the quantity of text to survive, well, some of the authors that do survive are very, very large. So Plutarch, for example, of course, who writes his famous bi biographies of um, Greek and Roman statesmen and, and generals, very, very large corpus. The, the Dr. Galen, whose corpus is so big, it accounts for 10% of all classical Greek literature by itself. Um, so some of these authors' um, bodies of work are very, very large um, indeed. But in terms of the total number of authors to survive, it's really quite, really quite low. And, and the quantity of text, despite uh, what I've just said, is also quite low. Okay, so can we do this for Latin authors? Look, I didn't have six years to um, spend trying to count all the Latin authors and their attestations. So I did it the quick and dirty way. I went and looked up the list of authors at the start of the Oxford Latin Dictionary. But this doesn't look, seem to have occurred to, to, to anybody else to do it, but you can do it in an afternoon. And what, here's, here's what I figured. So the Oxford Latin Dictionary cites over 700 different whole or fragmentary works from about 370 authors, including legal writers who are quoted in the, in the digest of Roman law. So it includes absolutely everybody. Um, now of that 370, 65 have works that are wholly or substantially extant. And we can add to that about 35 um, works that are, uh, we don't know who wrote them, um, but let's assume that they weren't written by anybody who belongs to the 65. We do know uh, our, our authors of work. So that brings us to about 100 classical Latin authors who have works that are fully extant. Either, you know, they can have a huge corpus like Cicero or they can have a very small one like the elegiac poet Tibullus. But it's only 100 in total. Um, so that's actually very small. I mean, if you go into uh, Waterstones, in 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 in, uh, in Belfast, you know, you find a hundred authors in the first three rows of books, as it were. So it's it's not that many, uh, as it were. So, and we can add to that. Well, I think it's about two hundred and seventy or so authors, uh, of whom only fragments uh, um, survive. So it's quite a small corpus, really, in terms of authors. Anyway, okay. So what's the conclusions for now? So these numbers are a bit rough and ready because the OLD doesn't cite all surviving authors as its sources. Um, I reckon it's, it, um, it cites about 80%, about somewhere between 60 and 80%. But I think that the basic starting point is you've got around 100 authors with fully surviving works or parts of works, maybe up to 125. And I think the same situation is uh, obtains us for Greek, we've probably got no more than 5%. That that 100 represents probably no more than 5% of the pre-200 AD authors. 
and the quantity of text that survives in antiquity is probably one to two percent uh, in total as well. And I just want to throw some, something in here. There is actually 10 times as much Greek, Greek literature that survives down to the fifth century AD than there is uh, Latin. Again, no one's done a, a, a count, I think, since the, the late 19th century. I think it's only, it's only got bigger since then. Um, why is there more Greek than Latin? Um, that's, that's a question I don't really know the answer to, but the Greeks have a much longer history. I mean, the, the Romans only really got started in the second and first century BC, whereas the Greeks have been gone since Homer. So there is a, a much, they've got, they've got a 600 year start on the Romans for producing literature. And I think that that's part of the answer anyway. Um, but I don't think it's all the answer. Okay, so big picture here is a hundred, no more than a hundred, 125 Latin authors survived from the classical period as defined by the OLD. So, right, so should we be very upset about losing 95% of the, of the authors and 90%, 98% of texts? And this is a, a favorite game amongst classicists. What lost work would you most like to see rediscovered? Or an even more brutal version of the game is what work that survives would you give away to have a lost work, as it were? So do you want more, more Euripides? We've only got, what, sort of 17 plays, is it? Um, even less by Aeschylus and Sophocles. Uh, we've got enough Aristotle already. You know, I don't think we need any more. There's, there's, there's loads. I mean, for those of you who remember Umberto Eco, the written name of the rose, it was the whole kind of premise was about wanting to get back the, the, the lost second book of the poetics, which is about comedy. Um, but I haven't got enough Aristotle to get on with. Do you want Ennius, the epic pope before Virgil? We'd understand Virgil a lot better if we had Ennius, it has to be said. And we'd understand Propertius and all his love elegies a lot better if we had Gallus, who's the poet from just, just before them. But having done a bit of thinking about this and looking at the figures, I don't think we need to be that upset. To be honest, I think we actually need to be grateful for how things panned out. So let's just look at why that might be. Okay, so at the end of the first century AD, in his great work on the education of the order, Quintilian lists 60 classic Latin authors that if you want to be an orator, you really should read. Now look, this man has got blind spots. He's, he's particularly comes to prose. Um, there's no novels there and uh, there's no pastoral poetry. There's no epigram, that sort of thing. So he's, he's got blind spots, but his tastes are really wide. He even recommends Catullus, who as we all know is very sweary and a bit rude. And his, his, his versification is, 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 is as rough as anything, but he still recommends Catullus. And he even recommends his supervillain, which is Seneca. He hates Seneca with a passion, but he still says he's worth reading. Okay, so he sets out 60 authors you really, you really need to read. So these are his classics. And of that 60, we still have a third of them in whole parts and fragments of you know, most of the rest. In particular, we have 40% of his recommended poets and stories, 40%, that's a huge number. So we either have um, whole works or parts of works by 40% uh, of the people that he thinks are most worth reading. And the reason why that, that's, that's important is that we have this conception in the ancient world that you can be prestigious without being popular. So for example, you know, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake is massively prestigious, but you know, you can count on not that many hands, those who've actually read it all, all the way through. And much modern poetry is highly prestigious, but very, really not popular. Um, in terms of sales and so on. That, that concept doesn't exist in the ancient world. If you're prestigious, you're, you're also popular. And if you're popular, you're also prestigious, so far as we can tell. Okay, so um, to summarize, only 5% of classical authors have survived in any form at all. But we have a disproportionately good sample of mainstream literature from the classical period. 40% of the things that Quintilian thinks are worth reading. And furthermore, Christian copyists agreed with Quintilian's choices, 
Christian copies are the ones who are responsible for um, uh, who, who basically are instrumental in deciding what makes it into the Middle Ages. So there's this great technological shift that we've lived, we've lived through a technological shift in our own time. You know, so I, I'm part of the last generation who remembers the time before the internet, and what life what life was like. And you tell your children and they're sort of, really? You, you had to do that? Yes. Now, they had their technological shift. They shifted from papyrus rolls, which is very perishable material, to parchment, which is expensive, but lasts for a very long time. And they start copying works onto a parchment. And if you get copied on a parchment, your chances of making it for the being preserved for the next 500 years are quite high. Um, and Christian copyists, when they decide what to copy and what to not bother about, they largely agree with Quintilian's choices. And they, they're the ones who copy a very large percentage of Quintilian's list. So now if, um, if you uh, go on to study classics or you're already studying classics, you'll be familiar with this series. This is the Cambridge Green and Yellow series, Cambridge Greek and Latin classics. And um, this is, you know, very, very, uh, it's fundamental to the um, curriculum now in, uh, um, across the English speaking world. Here's the thing, um, today we teach only probably 20 different authors from the surviving 100 at university, even at, even at PhD level, maybe, maybe up to 30 if you push it, but, um, and uh, most of those are on Quintilian's list. I mean, some of them came after Quintilian, so they couldn't be on his list, but it's remarkably stable. What Quintilian thought was good, what Christian copyists thought was good, and what we teach even now, so there's a direct line right back to Quintilian. So we have, may have 100 authors, but we only teach about 20, I think. So Now I want to look here to lay antiquity here, because this is a bit of a bugbear of mine about why the Oxford Latin Dictionary doesn't include lay antiquity and the effects that that has on the field. So if you think that green yellow series only has one author from it, uh, in it uh, uh, from lay antiquity, and that's um, Augustine and his confessions, um, which um, I'm actually going to be teaching in, in January using one of the green and yellow volumes. I'm looking forward to it a lot and I'll see what the students think of it. Um, it's a bit strange that we've uh, only got one late antique text. Why it's amazing is this Latin does not change in the essentials of morphology and syntax. So the endings of the words and the constructions. Now, they loosen a bit, but not much, between Cicero and Augustine. This is partly because they have a very standardized education system. Everyone studies the same cl classic authors. Everyone studies Virgil, even though, to, to, to between ourselves, to be quite honest, whatever language Virgil's writing, it isn't Latin, because it's really weird stuff. I mean, this is, isn't said often enough. If you want to read, you know, Latin, <laughs> as it was meant to be written, you have to read all of it. Virgil's writing a strange private language. Anyway, but everyone reads Virgil. Um, they read Horace, they read Terence, they read Salas, they read Cicero. So this is a standardized curriculum that, um, that continues for hundreds of years, right into the Middle Ages. And um, the language basically hardly changes. Now, I don't know what the rates of language change are in, in, in modern European languages. I think that we have a false idea of how close we are to Shakespeare simply because we know Shakespeare so well. But if you go back and read some of the prose from the 16th century or even the 15th century, it's quite a different language. Now, Latin is more complex than English in all sorts of ways because of, as you're learning from the non the all the cases and, uh, you know, a, a fully worked out set of genders and a proper subjunctive and all the rest of it. Um, and they had more to lose and get rid of um but it didn't it kept it all and here's the thing it, so why do we have this distinction between classical and late antique latin anyway good news is that training in classical latin will stand you in good stead for late, late antique latin and neo latin too now okay so try to answer this uh, question of how much latin is there afterwards now this is the bit that's really hard to answer and no one i think is trying to answer it but this is in another quick and dirty way of trying to answer this. So how much late antique Latin literature is there? Well, in 2020, saw the publication of volume six 
of the very sober and respectable Handbuch der Italienischen Literatur der Antike, covering the age of Theodosius, because he's his. This is the age in which pagan worship becomes illegal, basically, um, from so, uh, three seven four to four thirty. Though of course Theodosius doesn't live that long. But that's the what's called the age of Theodosius. It just covers um, you know fifty five years in two volumes. And it covers over 200 authors and pseudonymous or anonymous texts or collections of texts. So more than double the number of authors that survived from the four centuries to 200 AD. And that includes some very, very big corpora, Jerome and Augustine and Ambrose and so on. So just 55 years have um, uh, double the number that survived from before 200 AD. Now look, of course, Christian copyists are going to copy Christian works more than they're going to copy um, pagan works, but they're not <laughs> biased against pagan works in in, uh, in, in a way in a way that you you might think. Um, it's simply that the closer your text is written to the great leap into parchment codex, then the greater your chances of being copied are. Okay, so if you're writing a text in the second century BC, you have to wait 600 years before Parchment Codex comes along. So your chances of making it decrease with every decade. Whereas if your text is written in the year 370, well, the age of the Codex is already here. So your chances of being copied are actually quite high. So that partly counts for it. And that's what explains, so, you know, the, the, the disappearance of Sappho, um, the, the, the Greek uh, uh, poet Sappho, why do we not have staff where everyone agreed she was brilliant? Well, the answer is because she had to wait a thousand years from roughly the sixth century to BC to the fourth century, um, AD, a thousand years she had to wait, didn't make it. So anyway, so there's a lot of late antique literature. Again, no one's done the figures properly, but someone has done it for the rest of Latin, although they're not telling us the basis of their, of their, of their figures. This is uh, Jürgen Leonhardt's book, Story of a World Language, Latin. Now, on his first couple of pages, he, he has these mind-blowing statistics, but he doesn't tell you what the basis of them are, but they're still worth uh, um, just telling you about. He estimated that Christian texts compromise 80% of all Latin texts to survive antiquity. That includes inscriptions, so things that are written in stone. Um, so, so I think that seems to me very, very plausible. That, um, Late Christian late antique texts are, are four times the number of um, of classical texts, and then he reckons that classical and late antique literature in turn is dwarfed by post antique literature by ten thousand to one. Now he's cheating a bit. He's including anything written in Latin, like um, you know, if you you know the number of um, uh, dissertations on Latin law written in eight, in eighteenth century Czechoslovakia is actually very high. Um, or whatever Czech Czechoslovakia was called then. He's including all of them. I think it's cheating a bit, but it gives you some idea of the mass that's there. And so that means that post classical um, Latin texts, so anything written from sort of roughly 310 onwards, it dwarfs classical Latin by 50,000 to 1. So there's a lot of Latin out there. So an ideal of competence in all periods of Latin is clearly impossible. You can't be a good expert in everything. But there's a lot of Latin out there. And with the training in classical Latin, you can read a lot of it. That's why it's worth persevering, because what it gives you a ticket to is uh, a series of riches. And this, for me, you know, within my own field, I, instead of seeing classical Latin as the old historic center, you know, it's the nicest and best part of town. You know, when you, when you go to Rome, you want to stay in the historic center, don't you? Who wants to see the suburbs? But um, I think it's the wrong metaphor for thinking about classical Latin. I think we just see it as the beginning, the beginning of Latin. All right, thank you. I'm just going to stop there and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Roy. That was fantastic. That was so interesting. Such an interesting um, study. Uh, I did see, are we there? Yeah, I did see some. Um, questions in the in the chat if you bear with me um Lauren is asking since the green and yellows 
limit the Christian late antique texts. Is there another series of commentaries or texts that you would recommend for late antiquity? Uh, it's kind of it's, it's kind of a bit a bit hit and miss, uh, to be honest. I me, mean, Aris and Phillips do quite good editions of Augustine, um, and a lot of American university presses do do good editions of um, of Christian poetry. So my friend Aaron Peltari in um, Edinburgh has done one with an American press on uh, Prudentius, that sort of thing. It's a bit hit and miss, but it's partly hit and miss because there are so many texts out there compared to the to the um, to the classical corpus. And having spoken to the editors of the, of the Green and Green and Yellow series, um, I would I would say that it's them. They're they're not actually seeking to exclude late antique texts. It's more they're finding difficulty recruiting people to do it, as it were. That's certainly the case in the in the last in the in the, in, in the last twenty years. Uh, as it were, so um, they're certainly keen on it, and they think they have plans for um, more late antique texts. I mean, they've, they've been trying to get someone to do, you know, Sidonius, so Apollinaris for, for decades, but um, uh, and they've finally got someone to do it, um, and that'll be interesting um, to, to see that. So. Thank you, um, and thanks, Lauren, for the question. Uh, Andre is asking. Does Augustine's extra Latin reflect developments, Augustinian innovations, or just extra Latin, which existed anyway, which we had no previous evidence for? Um, but in a corpus of five million words, it's kind of difficult to uh, generalize, as it were. But Augustine is purposefully capable of writing Latin like Cicero did, if when he wants to. Um, one of the amazing things is that okay, the, the syntax and morphology of Latin, so the endings and the, the grammar don't change in Latin very much. But what does change is pronunciation. And you're moving away from a quantity-based pronunciation where what determines how a word is um, pronounced is how long the syllables are. And it's gradually moving to, an, um, like in English is now, a um, based on emphasis. So where, where you put the, the stress when you when you speak a word. And people didn't know their, their quantities anymore. And it was hard, it was became harder and harder for people to write prose like Cicero was done, because that's how he, he, he did it. But Augustine could do it, but he doesn't do it in every work. And he chooses his styles. So the Confessions is, is written in a completely new style. It's expressed as a kind of prayer to God. Um, all the way through, as you know, and that completely changes the style of Latin uh, that he writes. I think it's fascinating, but we'll find out in January whether my students think that or they actually have an unexpressed desire for Cicero in their hearts, so um, which they didn't know they had. Um, so I think that yes, there's evidence of language change in 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 Augustine, and he he, he changes his style to suit his subject. I think, yeah. And of course, there's the whole development of what's known as the, the sermo humilis, so the, the humble style of speech. That, that's the style that the, 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 the Bible, the, the, of the Latin translation of the Bible. So that's Jerome's translation. And that starts off a whole new style as well, which is much less um, overloaded. I mean, classical Latin, particularly when Cicero writes it, can be very overloaded and sentences that go on for but like, you know, that often modern German, modern academic German can go on for half a page, as it were. And the Sermo Humanist doesn't do any of that. It's much shorter sentences and, uh, and so on. So, so uh, Augustine, you can find whatever style you want in Augustine, basically. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, question from Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Did Christian copyists, for example, the monks of Bangor's very strict abbey, express no need to censor classical texts? By declining to copy them, I can't even know that. Oh, right, just, Joanne, thank you. That's of course it's impossible to, to 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 answer that question. And um, one of the oddest things is that uh, when education, now I'm straying into an area that I only really know marginally. So there'll be people in the audience who know a lot more than I do about this and can correct me. But so long as education takes place within a monastic context. 
it seems that they're much less bothered about the content content of a text because they can control the atmosphere. So one of the oddest things is Ovid's Ars Matoria is used by um, St Dunstan as an educational text um, in I forget what it was eleventh century I can't remember but. And it's, we know it's used all over, all over Europe in monastic schools as a way of teaching Latin. But the context, of course, the content, of course, is absolutely shocking. It's telling men how to seduce women and women how to be seduced by men. But in a monastic context, they, they don't seem to care about that because they can control it. It's when it moves out into a secular environment, when the secular universities are founded, that's when people start to get bothered because the monks can't control how how you think about the text anymore. Um, I think that that's what then starts to create doubts about it. But otherwise, I mean, what accounts for who, what gets copied and what, and what doesn't? I think there's a general agreement on what is really good, high quality literature. And Catullus is lucky because his versification, as we all know, is, it's, a bit, it's a bit primitive. Elisions all over the place, meter a bit roughly handled, things are, you know, um, syllables shortened or lengthened, um, uh, you know, and compared to the standard of the poetry that produced after his lifetime, it was just, it, Catullus is technically not that impressive at all. And so given that I think they were trying to copy what they saw as good Latin text, he can count himself lucky that he survived in a single copy. Um, of course, but you know, and I think Tacitus is the same. I mean, Tacitus survives in a single copy. There's a reason for that. Like Virgil, whatever whatever language he's writing, it isn't Latin. It's just it's just it's a private language he made up. Um, now, that of course raises the question why on the Greek side, Thucydides survived, who's also writing a private language of his own, his own device. God knows what he's on about. Um, and so that that's a question why why Thucydides makes it through beautifully and Tacitus doesn't. But the Latin, everyone agreed that the premier Latin historian was Sallust. Tacitus, no one's interested after, after a certain point. So it's quite, but they liked his style very much and they liked his moralism very much. So. Thank you. Um, there is a, an interesting question in the chat from Leila. I don't know if you can answer this. Thanks, Leila, for the question. Roughly, how many Latin words are there? <laughs> oh, right. No, no, I don't know that. But you, you can count the OLD for yourself. So, um, you know, you can work out how many pages there are and how many, you know, on average, how many words per page. And you can, you can do it from there. But these questions are answerable. You've asked a question that is very answerable. It's just that no one's had the patience to go through and count. So, you know, why not? And then publish your results. Tell us how many words. I mean, I expect the OLD may have it on, 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 on its website, but I know from speaking to the people and okay, so the, the really big dictionary is the, is the Tessaurus Lingua Latinae. And this has been going in Munich since 1894. And um, they reached the, finished the letter P, what, three years ago? And they're now into letter R, and they're still going. They've left out the letters N and O because they're just too difficult. They're coming back to them. Because you know, N has got known and nay and nisi and all the really difficult words in it that no one wants to deal with. They're drawn to R, which is much easier. Um, Anyway, they cover Latin up to the 6th century AD. However, not even they know how many authors, um, much less how many words are covered, as it were. So and I, I spoke to the people, the, the, the uh, thesaurus, they said, we don't know. <laughs> well, you can find out by just counting. But uh, there you go. So I think that these are kind of, sort of fundamental questions, which, are, which tell you a lot about the big picture. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I say in the chat, Joanne says, we've made Layla learn most of the words in Upper Intermediate Latin class. Um, uh, I don't see any other questions. There's a lot of interesting comments there, but I want to ask, just to finish, what lost work would you like to see rediscovered? Oh my goodness, what a question. Um, 
if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I'd been clear, I would, I, I would like Gallus, who's the Roman lavellogist just before Ovid and Propertius and Tobias. Um, because six lines of his were discovered in Upper Egypt in 1978 um, and were published in the, in the late 70s. And the industry that has gone into explaining those six lines since then, it would fill many, many books, as it were. Um, but I'm much less sure now that I would want Gallus, um, as it were. So um, now, because of the area I'm working in, I think I'd like even more of, of Cicero's letters, personally. I'd like his letters to Caesar, um, as it were. So the answer changes according to whatever I'm working on at the minute. I'm afraid I'm someone who tends to be very focused on whatever he's working on at the minute and then forgets about everything else. So that's why I would say I like Cicero's letters to Caesar. Okay. Well, on that note, if there are no other questions, um, I think we will say thank you very much to Roy for joining us today. What, uh, oh, the, oh, as it, just as I said that, who's your favorite author? <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Tricia. Well, you know, I wouldn't have thought, it's just, just getting old, obviously, but I would never have said this 30 years ago, but you, you mustn't tell anybody else. It's going to be recorded, isn't it? Okay. Um, Cicero. Okay. And Ovid. They don't go very well together, but on the verse side, definitely Ovid, yeah. And um, on the prose, I think, I mean, you know, I like some bits of Cicero. I love, I love the letters. I think they're just, I mean, I've read just read the ad attica from cover to cover. It's an amazing read, absolutely amazing. Took a long time, but um, yeah, I'd say on the verse side of it, on the pro side, definitely Cicero. And I wouldn't have said that thirty years ago. Okay, super. Thank you so much, everyone. If you can join with me, you know, in um, thanking Professor Gibson for that fascinating talk and for joining us today. We're delighted to have you. It's been a great conclusion to the, um, the, the series, the lecture series. Um, and just so pleased to have you and love that Northern Irish accent. Um, great, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. And thank you to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gibson there down the, down the Cumber Road. Um, thank you everybody. And uh, best wishes. We'll see the students again tomorrow. Um, but that's that's us for today. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, thank you so much indeed, Helen. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye. everybody. Bye bye.